we save the, the best for last, uh, we have um, uh, Dylan Taylor. Dylan was actually here last year. If you, if you probably didn't recognize him because he used to use a barber. So, um, uh, um, but uh, he's going to talk about. Uh, he's, he's launching uh, his his graduate program with Andrew Elmore, who you're going to hear about uh, a little bit later, on uh, some uh, CNO Canal project. I like I like to say that I'm saving my hair to give to Bill. Uh, and lots of love. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, thanks for hanging with us. Um, I know it's almost lunchtime, but hopefully this will only take up five more minutes of your time and, um, and we can get into some grub. Um, so, uh, like Bill said, I'm a first year master's student working at the UMC's Appalachian Laboratory. Um, so, uh, just up the hill in Frostburg. Um, and today I just want to talk to you and give you a, a brief introduction of my planned research and what we've done so far. Um, so I'm working on a project that will um, help with informed habitat management um, within and, and surrounding the Sino Canal National Park. Um, and so the Sino Canal National Park, um, just to give you some context of how we developed um, the model that I'm creating, um, is a, it's a 184 mile long national park. Um, it goes from Washington, D.C. all the way out to Cumberland, Maryland. Um, and it's you can barely see it in this in this image, but it's this long, thin, um, sort of sometimes as thin as a half mile wide strip of, of natural and cultural resources um, that is all preserved as a national park, and um, and and there's varying habitat within the park um, that that the park can manage, and so. Um, when we were developing the model that I've, I've been working on, um, we talked to manager, natural resource managers at the park, and we were able to work with the managers to understand what actual levers they have that they can pull. And, um, and, and it's pretty limited. Um, you know, the Sino Canal National Park mostly manages for cultural resources, as Emily was talking about earlier. Um, but they do have some, some, some options for um, natural resource management. Um, and so, like, th this little graphic up here sort of shows um, what you would consider the current state of the park. So um, a lot of forested and, um, and ag lands, so a lot of hay harvesting. Um, and there's sort of what we've determined as two management strategies um, that, that natural resource managers can do. So there are some farmers in the park who are willing to let some of their um, hay fields grow out into shrubland or um, even grow out into forests. Um, and, and so depending on, on how that habitat would benefit different species, um, the, the natural resource managers could, could go that route. And then the natural resources managers at the park uh, try to work with, um, you know, uh, state agencies and and different uh, nonprofits um, to manage the lands surrounding the park, and so our hope is that they could collaborate with different um, agencies in order to create habitat that's going to best benefit the species that are seeking refuge in the park and that are are, are finding their way around the park. Um, so, what species you may ask? Um, we are looking at three different bird species and, and trying to understand the way that they are using habitat in and around the park. Um, so this is a golden winged warbler. They're really cute uh, little birds. Um, and, and the way the golden winged warbler uses habitat is, um, it's a little hard to see in the slide, but you have this little blue dot down here is the nesting site. And so um, this bird was monitored in Pennsylvania and you can kind of see the general way that they use different habitats. But in the first couple of days of its life after it's hatched in shrubland, um, so, so the lighter green area is, is shrubby, sort of short, uh, 10 to 15 feet tall shrubland. That's where golden wings make their nests, and that's where the bird was hatched. And then it kind of grew up and got a little bit older. And um, after a few days of spending refuge in the close to mom and dad, um, this bird made its way out into uh, old old growth forest, and so um, these these specific birds really thrive in um, 
in mixed habitat and having some shrubland there for the earlier stages and, and having some, some older forest there um, as they become adults. Um, and so golden-winged warbler here in the middle are one of the three species that are being included in my model. Um, Cerulean warbler here to the left are another species, and then um, the wood thrush is the third species in my model. And these species were chosen, A, because, um, you know, it, stuff's not looking good for them, uh, especially in the Appalachian region. These three species have, have seen some serious declines in the, in the past two decades. Um, up to half of the gold-winged warbler population has been lost. And, and they largely think this is due to um, lack of habitat. Um, and lack of good habitat for them. And so we chose them also because um, they have different levels of reliance on, on shrubland and, and different structured forests. So um, like I said, the gold-winged kind of likes the shrubland mixed with um, um, bigger, taller forest, old-growth forest. Um, uh, wood thrush really thrives in huge, non-fragmented um, pieces of, of tall, old-growth forest. And then cerulean kind of likes the in-between. Um, so they like the forest to be open canopy and, and have a lot of space so that there, there is some, some shrubland within the forest. Um, so um, essentially what I've been doing is, is compiling uh, remotely sensed data. So Maryland does uh, some really good LIDAR surveys um, that have been really useful for um, engineering, but um, scientists have been able to kind of take advantage of that and, and make some really um, high resolution canopy height and biomass layers. Um, and then there's a lot of really cool remotely sensed um, satellite imagery that we can use to create things like the National Land Cover data set and, and to understand what habitat we have. And I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with those tools. And so my model, essentially, it, it builds a, a simulated version of the habitat in and surrounding the CNO canal. And then we get to do a couple of, of we get to mess around with simulated changes in that habitat. Um, and so you can look at the current state and then um, what would what might happen if um, farmers grew some of their lands out into shrubland. And then you can look at what would happen if some of the lands surrounding the park um, maybe switched to shrubland or, or preserved as, as whole forest um, fragments. And so um, you can look at it for wood thrush, ceruleans, and gold wings, and you can try and understand um, you know, which one of these is going to be best for all three species and all of the species that may associate with these three species that use habitat in such different um, ways. And, and the one real thing that's really cool that I want to um, impress upon you about this project is that we've been able to collaborate with the National Park Service, um, National Park Service Resource Manager, and sort of be like, you know, you could actually act on these things, but we want to give you the science that, that will help you to, to make a more informed decision when you're going to talk to your partners or to those farmers and say, you know, we want to grow this out, but this is why. Um, and so thank you for your time, um, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Um, and before we get to lunch, please. Yeah. Anyone, have you gotten to talk to the farmers directly? Yeah. I haven't. No, the, um, the National Park Service uh, resource manager has, has talked to them, and, and they're, they're old uh, hay fields that they're kind of, it's kind of funny, like, the farmers are like, well, we could keep harvesting them or we could not, you know? Either way, um, kind of you tell us what to do. And I hope to at some point, but I, I don't really have anything to say to them yet because <laughs> we don't really know what the effects would be. Okay. Well, I think it's time for lunch. Yeah. But thank you. Go on. Great. So.